fetish. I'm Randy. <laughs> That's Andy. We haven't been up here for a while. I was away, as you might know, and but it's been so hot. It's been way too hot to come up to the vinyl attic. The whole West Coast is on fire. We're sweating. Yeah. But we're back. We're back. And we're gonna what are we gonna talk about? What do we have? We have a top five. We have for you fine people our top five eighties records. Eighties albums. I think when a lot of people think of the Is 80s, it records or yeah, albums? No, al albums. A record can be a single or a song or a recording. Album. Okay, albums. Song. I think a lot of people, especially younger people, when they think of the 80s, they think of like MTV video videos. I think that's kind you of what we You mean younger we're... people as in your wife? Yeah. So <laughs> we're going to do top five. We're going to do my top five and your top five. And it's, I think it's a little bit different. I mean, I'm totally anxious on your perspective because I live through the 80s. So each one of these albums has like a personal connection. And I didn't live through and, but the you, 80s, but, but so. in a way you have a, like a pure sense, right? Because for you it's just like the music as opposed to, you know. Well, not really because now it's like the hip thing to listen to, you know, the throwbacks. The eight really ladies. So. Okay. So what I thought I'd do before we get started is there's so many great albums from the so 80s sweet. there's this uh, when i was like trying to put my top five together it was almost impossible and i left out uh, i just want i when i do these top fives i like to show what what it didn't make it to my top five and so just before we get started i, I have some albums and they may be on your top five because i don't know what your top five is and you don't know what my top five is i have an idea though so um <laughs> the clash is london calling not on my top five rolling stone pick this is the number one album of the 80s um, it was recorded in 1979 and it came out in early 1980. It was a huge favorite of mine when it came out. Uh, I don't have it. I kind of, kind of think of it as like a 70s record more than an 80s record. Not How many non-top five albums do you have? Three. Okay. <laughs> okay. Prince, Purple Rain, the late great Prince. Not on my list for personal reasons that we won't get into. <laughs> for another episode uh, uh, yeah she was never your girlfriend uh, we know that everybody knows that now thank you <laughs> um guns and roses appetite for destruction 1987 not on my top five this is the original band cover kind of rapey cover right not, not appropriate kind of. it's pretty rapey robot it's rapey yeah this is this is actually belongs to amy bone steel i borrowed it and still haven't given it back after <laughs> 30 years. Sorry, Amy. Uh, not in my, an amazing album that had a huge impact on the world and on me. Not in my top five. So before we get to my top five, let's start with your number five and then we'll go back and forth. Well, let's just have a moment of silence because obviously your top five and my top five are going to be different because you're a little bit older than I am. Yes. And also the way that people listen to music is different now. That is a very good point. So. That's why I think this will be very interesting. Because we it, have like different so, ways of thinking of this music. Okay, but don't judge my choices oh, because. Where's my beer? My number five is somebody that I've always loved. I bought her records the day they came out. Although, obviously not, not, in not in the 80s. But. Madonna, Madonna. Of course. The, Madonna, first, the Madonna. first Madonna, 1983? Yeah. Great record. Great record. I was working at a record store when that came out in 1983, and we played it constantly. It was cool to be punk rock and like that Madonna record, because she was like New York Underground. What? So what's your favorite? What, why do you love that record so much? Well, it's just, uh, so I, I think the first record that I fell in love with, well, first of all, music, the single, mm. music. But, okay. And then I... Um, the Confessions tour was amazing. I and then you went back and found your yeah, first and album? I, well, yeah, and then I, you go back. It's so weird how, how people my age listen to music from before because, you know, obviously that's not the first thing I heard from her. Mm. But it was so cool to go back and, and see, like, she's freaking amazing. That record, that record is in this collection. Wow, so I do hope. you think that... That's lame. And uh, no, no, like, I think it's a great record. That's not how I was like introduced to her, but that's how. No, no, I think it, it's an, it's significant, as well as a great record. It was a real turning point that made dance music cool in the eighties. I think it's a great record. I love it. It's love like it. if Jelly you... Bean Bennett's produced it. Yeah, 
Okay, yeah. so, but it's like if you found a, an artist like Bowie and you found like his yeah. 80s stuff or 90s stuff first. Mm -hmm. And then you had all this stuff sure. that you could go back to. It's pretty cool. You actually. have, you, that is a well-worn tradition of going back. Go back. Right. I heard Wings before I heard the Beatles. So. Yeah. So there you go. All right, so my number five is from 1983, R.E.M.'s Murmur album, their first full album with the kudzu. From down the road from where I live, they're from Athens, Georgia. I used to see them play. I saw them open for the police in 1980. This record really captured the, so the new south. Because when you think of southern rock, it's like Leonard Skinner and Outlaws and stuff like that. This was the new south emerging. Um, got to know them. Kind of have a long history with Peter. Peter who lives right down the road now. Um, and it's just a great record. I can't listen to this without going back to those days, those sort of college days. This was like college music of the 80s. This was like played nonstop. So Murmur by R.E.M. is my number five. Uh, can I ask you something? Yeah. Are all your top fives, like, are you related to them in a way? Come on, seriously? Uh, not all, not all of them. Not, not all of them, not all of them, not all of them. Okay. <laughs> This is not a popularity contest. No, but um, they're also great records. I was lucky in that I had a personal connection to some of the best music of the 80s. Okay. Okay, so... Alright, my turn? Yeah, number four. Okay, number four. <laughs> number four, like <laughs> Sesame Street. Hold on. Okay, you're number four. Number four for me is... Uh, Tattoo You. Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones. 1982. Good choice. I love that record. 1981, actually. 1981, it came out. I love that record oh, so much. I love it. Like, slave. I love the look. I want to be your slave. TNA. She's my little <laughs> TNA. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. Okay, but come on. Like, from beginning to end, that record is amazing. Yeah, and can I tell you a secret? Every song. Can I tell you a secret about that record? Oh god, what? That record is actually outtakes from earlier Rolling Stones albums that they just sort of put together. You mean they didn't like mean it to be? It, it wasn't originally planned to be an album. Some of it's new. Oh god. Like Start Me Up I think was a new track, but uh, most of it is just, in fact, some of their old guitarist Mick Taylor's on it because some of that stuff goes way back to the early 70s. I know, but it's a perfect album. It has a perfect feel. That's the beauty of it. it I mean, well, you just ruined it for me. No, but I'm saying it's, that's like, it's like a happy accident that they put all those things together and it, they all hang together, hang hang fire. They all hang together so well. Awesome selection. Saw that tour twice, including in Leeds, England, where the last episode of the show was from. Okay. <laughs> so, want my number four? Yeah. My number four is, I don't have it on vinyl, 1988, Public Enemy, It Takes a Nation to Hold Us Back. This this is a cassette tape for you kids out there. Um, this album changed the face of hip hop. Wait 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 wait. So why have I never heard you play this? Well, because a lot. Of, well, a lot because a lot of rap music is frozen in time, and it just captures that time, and it's hard to listen to it afterwards. Like I don't think you were gonna listen to Kendrick Lamar's first record five years from now because well, yeah but if it's on your top five it means it, you it, listen to it, it. i you listen, to, listen this to it constantly a lot. i listen to this constantly i can do you want me to do black hour and <laughs> black chaos and that oh i can't even remember the title right now. <laughs> um really chuck oh, d okay. and flavor flav this record bring the noise bring the noise um we would listen to it we would dissect it all the samples this is created with all these samples all these layers and we would just listen to it like maniacs trying to figure out where now you just go on wikipedia and it tells you where all the samples are from but we used to listen to it and dissect it it was a statement about race and and politics in the late 80s did you feel okay listening listening to that yes I, in fact i went to this show i went to this tour in atlanta and opening was heavy d and the boys and at the bottom was mc hammer and i was wearing a malcolm x identity patch and a lot of brothers looked at me and just went cracker 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 so we got a lot of shit for going to see in atlanta ga which is a very african-american city seeing public enemy but i didn't care this record was so important to me public enemy my number four so if it was important to you imagine how important it was to them i know i agree because if it's important to a white boy 
white sociologist. Yeah, but you're still a white boy. Okay, you're at number three. My boyfriend's band. Oh, uh, was that Weird Al Yankovic? <laughs> Another one gets on the bus. My boyfriend's Sting. Oh, uh, I should have known. Synchronicity. Synchronicity, 1983. I love it so much. That is a great record. King of Pain, my theme song. Uh, yeah. King of Pain. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's the best Police album, but um, but it's it's pretty epic. That I camped out for that tour. I was, you know, it's a whole other story about backstage at that Police show. But yeah, um, I wish. I wish. But so what? What is it about that record? So, so you know, they, I, they have they have a lot of great records from the eighties. Okay, so what's it about like, that one? Like Madonna, I first heard Sting, obviously, because it was like you know I was born after the Police. That was their last record, right? Yeah. So I uh, heard I heard Sting, and did you know that Paul McCartney uh, was at a concert and he's like talking about Sting and he's like. I wish that I had written Fields of Gold. If there's like a couple uh, songs that I wish I had really? written, Fields of Gold would have been a one. I can see it. I can see it. And Especially Sting. since Paul in the 80s was kind of sucky. Hey! Paul well, not. Paul was at his low. Come on, let's be honest. Paul in the 1980s. Okay, but he's saying there are no that Paul now. McCartney. I know, but there are no. Well, okay. He said it now. Oh, really? Yes, he said it now. Mm -hmm. So, I first, heard, I first heard Sting, and then I, you know, realized, I don't know how, I don't know how I, I found out that he had a band. It's so, I'm sorry, it's like, I'm it's young. Right. It's alright, I think it's groovy. Well, I'm still, like, actually, groovy. I think I have a much more exciting music discovery than you, because I don't know everything in the past, and you do. I can't imagine how bored you are. Because right now, like, you're not getting much of a exciting... Yeah, there's a lot to discover for you. Yeah, and for you, you already no, know I've it already all. Been there, already, so imagine... I was already you're, at the show. Your treasure chest is uh, looking a little... A little <laughs> there's plenty up. to discover. All right, my number three. I want to make sure the ladies were represented in my top five. And there's some good choices. You had Madonna. I thought about... Madonna's Like a Virgin album, which is one of the great, great records of the 80s. Mm -hmm. I picked Joan Jett's second solo album, I Love Rock and Roll, from 1982. So great. Good God, we played this record. And you might notice <laughs> this says on the cover, To Randy, Lots of Love, Joan Jett. Um, I had a little meeting Did with you Joan. have, like, toothpaste on your face when no, you I had that? No, I had clear cell. I had clear cell on my face that I forgot to wipe <laughs> off. So if you see the picture of me, I have, like, a streak... Okay. I was 18, and I was like, I was in a rush to meet Joan Jenna, and wash the clear soul off my She's face. She's pretty cool. This is just such a rock and roll record. So many great songs, and and Crimson this and Clover. Is this is this is one of the Black Hearts. One of them signed it. I don't know which one was there. Um, they yeah. Like they don't matter. Well. Doesn't matter. Joan's still going strong. Joan Jet. I love rock and roll. Now it gets played all the time, but as a whole, as an album. It's really great. And the original version has Little Drummer Boy on it. This is the first version that came out, which is really hard to find now, where she has a Christmas song on it. <laughs> so that's kind of weird. So this is probably worth something, just by the fact that it's signed. Okay, that's my number three. You're number th three. No, you're number two. Oh, we're up to number two. Ta da! Number two. And it's The River by Bruce oh, Springsteen. 1980. Double uh, album. That's a great and one. And I was at the 40th. Yeah, anniversary right, right. of the of the album. Uh, yeah, I was with you. Oh, you were, yeah. Okay. So. I was at the original tour of that uh. in 1980. <laughs> I camped out for three days in Atlanta as a 16 year old in the freezing concrete in front of the Omni. So why? So a lot of great Springsteen albums from the 80s. Okay. Um, why that one? Because, why not Born in uh, the USA or Nebraska or okay, The Tunnel so of Love? Okay. So first of all, the river, the song, the oh, river is. I got Mary pregnant. Okay, Something it's like romantic in a effed up way, but also I feel like it's very relatable to like the immigrant way of live of life because he, he what he's talking about is kind of like the immigrant way of life except class. for you know immigrants don't aren't listening to Bruce Springsteen because they don't. That, that's very moving because I think you're absolutely right. I think there's a parallel, and I think Bruce is kind of. Um, 
The working class. Yeah, it's very working class, kind of Woody Guthrie type thing, had Grapes of Wrath. It is very immigrant oriented. But also, he's he's working class. Wow, blew my mind. He's working class, but he's also very smart, poetic. So, okay, my number two. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about my number two, because it might not be a record that you've heard me play, which is from 1984, The Replacements Let It Be album. This is an album that kind of defined the post-punk era uh, out of Minneapolis, this band. One of the songs produced by Pete Buck from R.E.M., so there was a connection. But this is just a brilliant record, and it's also very poetic. It's kind of Springsteen-y in its way. Um, and they do a Kiss cover on it, which is why I first bought it, Black Diamond. And it was, this was just, this became our style. The way these guys dress, <laughs> these kind of ragamuffin look. Like, my, I grew my hair and started dressing. This is kind of like the pre-grunge thing, but a really great songwriter, Paul Westerberg. And just really, really passionate, real music. Um, I'm so unsatisfied is one of the songs. I'm so uns It's just really sort of white soul music. <laughs> If you can say that without sounding racist, it's just really passionate and it defined kind of alternative rock for everything to come, Nirvana and all that stuff. It really starts with this record from The Replacements. It's just, it's perfect through and through every bit of it, right up to the kiss. I'll play, I'll play some of it for you, but um, there is a great song on here called Gary's Got a Boner. So you might enjoy that one <laughs> if you don't know the rest of the record. That's my okay. number two, The Replacements. Okay. Now your number one of the record of the eighties, number can one just, album. Can I just say I have a, a runner up to my number one? Oh yeah, sure. One? You have to. You can say it like because I did. Because it was like, really what hard. Make it? Okay. And I think you know, being with you has really opened up my, you know, my world of music. Oh, obviously. Music. <laughs> uh, so I found this. I was introduced to this band by you. Oh. Oh. And I've also seen this guy twice. Okay. Who, who could it be? Uh, Weird Al Yankovic <laughs> again. No? Come on. Okay. Um, the runner-up was Cafe Blue. Oh. The Style really? Council. The Style Council? That's a great Style Council record. I lived that record. I was the cappuccino kid of Atlanta, Georgia. I yeah. would have beat you at that game if I were. Yeah, you and I around. could have been on a Vespa going out to have going to see some jazz and. You would have been on the back of my Vespa. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> it's like a scene from Absolute Beginners. Okay, so I love that. that's a great one. Yeah, style. Yeah, I don't have any style. Uh, or and did even you early jam like the or, or the late jam like the jam sound effects album from 1980 is certainly in my top ten. Yeah, and did you know that they changed the name of? To, from yeah. Cafe Blue to my own. My ever changing yeah. Ones, yeah, for the American. For, yeah, you yeah. know that? Yeah, of I've got both of them back here on vinyl. And they have different names? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay, so. You're number one. Number one is Diamond Life. I knew, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. That's why I hesitated when you started talking about the Style Council because they kind of go together. Okay, tell us about this artist. I. I mean, come on, like, I, there's like a revival of Sade lovers right now. Mm -hmm. They're like discovering her, but I just love how like classy and I know people will say that her music is boring and I think that you can take her in like small doses, mm -hmm. but I really love her songs and her persona and because she's so mysterious, it just like... I don't know, I feel like if I want if I want a soundtrack to my life, I want Sade to be like singing in the back. Yeah. In my life. Right, with her like long gloves <laughs> on and her slinky dress. I just love her. Ooh, and I hope she comes as she tours again. Yeah, I, really I, I got see to her. see her once in eighty five at Live Aid and it was magical. That's great. I don't know. I don't even know why I love her so much, honestly. Like, I just She evokes love a her. certain sense of place. Like, you feel like you're in a smoky jazz bar whenever she's singing. Yes. Yeah, you feel like you're in, like, the coolest place in the world. When you feel music. like you already have, like, three cocktails. Three, and, and working on the fourth. <laughs> so, yeah. yes. That's a great one. That Diamond is a life. great one. Diamond Life, Sade. I would not argue with that. Okay, so my number one... I have a theory that the best album of every decade comes out the seventh year of that decade, and this fits in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Mine is from 1987, and it is a record 
that I can't tell you. I mean, I was personally connected to it. This is a record that I kind of, this is a band that I had an, a relationship with. And the, so I knew a little bit about it before it came out. And you know who it is, right? We're talking about U2, U2, a connection, uh, which I could go on and on about, but the Joshua Tree, 1987. And I'll, I just want to tell one story. I mean, this, this is a record, it captures what was happening in the world, what was happening in America. It's sprawling and epic and you just want to drive through the desert and listen to it with all the windows down. And I've done that driving through Utah, just screaming the lyrics out of my lungs. But I want to just tell one little story about this album. I was in Los Angeles uh, the week that it came out and they were playing it on, uh, on KNAC, which is a big rock station. They said, U2 is coming to town to play at the LA Forum. Tickets go on sale in 10 minutes. And I'm driving around LA, cars, and I knew I wouldn't be in LA when the concert was, and I was gonna see them in Atlanta, but I, I saw cars turn in the middle of the road because everybody was listening to KNAC and to drive to the ticket outlet, like crashing, driving, and then I'm just driving and they're playing and it sounds so good. And then I'm driving up into the, into the Hollywood Hills up to Mulholland and they said, that show is sold out. The second U2 show goes on sale in 10 minutes and I saw more cars like turning and crashing into each other and people having to, and then I get to the top of Mulholland Drive and I'm on the top and Bullet the Blue Sky is playing. It's one of those great songs from this record. And they say the second show is now sold out. The third and final show goes on sale in 10 minutes. And cars were driving through yards to get down to the valley to get to some ticket outlet. That was the mania that was U2 in 1987. Mm -hmm. And you know, where the streets have no name, they filmed it on the rooftop in LA and you see all the kids coming out. I mean, they were a real phenomenon. It was like a sense of hope through music. And I don't know if there's really been anything like that since, the sense of positivity through one album generating so much kind of goodwill and feeling like you are connected to something much bigger. And that that album and that tour were great. And they tried to go back and redo it. Recently they did like a, whatever, 100th anniversary <laughs> tour of the Joshua Tree. And it's just, yeah. I didn't even go because there's no way you could recapture that moment. You don't want to ruin it. So to me, far and above yeah. everything else, that is the, the greatest album of the 80s. The Joshua Tree, you too. Love you guys. Bono, give me a call. Yeah, it's, right. um, it's hard to come up with the five, because, yeah. I mean, Bowie. Yeah, 80s, a little, I don't know, challenging. I mean, Let's Dance is great, but I wasn't crazy about it when it came out. Scary Monsters, 1980. Ashes to Ashes. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. Any other? No, I'm, yeah. I'm sticking to what I okay. picked, All right. so. Yeah, I had a lot of choices, um, but those are my five. All right, what are your top five, or what? what's your favorite album of the 80s put it down in the comment section we'd love to know we're probably forgetting something really good so our loyal listeners will remind us right on yeah All right, well thanks uh i'm heading off to dc this week so i'm going to try to find a good record store in our nation's capital i'm doing a thing on capitol hill uh and so watch for that randy on the road and then we'll be back up here in the hot sweaty vinyl attic <laughs> Can we just go hose ourselves off? Now, maybe some yes, firefighters down go. the street a little hose us down with their big, powerful fire hoses. Uh, yeah, let's what go. What was that about? <laughs> okay, oh. peace. Love you. Outside. Bye. Always first with something.